Research by Springer shows that the best Q1 journals reject up to 9 out of 10 of submitted papers. So if you want your research paper to be among the 10% that has the chance of being accepted, this video will show you exactly how to meet the standard of even the most rigorous Q1 Scopus Index journals. Why do the best journals reject even as many as 90% of submitted papers? Well, research by Vernon et al. that analyzed 898 rejections found that the most common reason was lack of novelty. Similarly, research by Agerfolk points to insufficient contribution to the field. In other words, most papers get rejected because you do not sell the reviewers or the editors on why your paper should actually be accepted. Now that you know this, how can we avoid the fate of 90% of papers? Look, we all judge the book, or in this case the paper, by its cover. And journal reviewers are no different. They will form the first impression about your paper very, very quickly. That's why you need to sell them on how novel and groundbreaking your research idea is right in the introduction. And there are three main ways in which you can do this. So right at the start, what you want to do is clearly state why your topic is important for your discipline, for the society or the world in general, or as an unresolved solved problem that needs to be solved right now. And in order to illustrate this in practice, let's look at this paper published in the journal Nature. The title of the paper is The Phased Pangenome of a Tetraploid European Potato. So if you're a potato lover, you will love this paper as well. So what do the authors do in the first paragraph that's so powerful that truly showcases the importance of the topic? Well, if we look at the very first sentence, that clearly highlights the importance of this topic for the society. I mean, potato is the most important non-cereal food crop and it feeds over a billion people worldwide. And then, so that's the important for the society, but they also present the importance of the topic as an unresolved problem. Because if we look at the following sentence, they clearly highlight that improvement of potato crops has not been that successful as other crops. So right then and there, the importance of this topic in this paper is very, very clear. Now, the second way in which you really need to highlight why your paper is novel and why it should be published is what is called the research gap. In other words, you need to state how your paper differs from previous papers. And again, let's look at the journal Nature and this paper on Parkinson's disease. So when we look at this first sentence, it states that some studies have already been done on this topic. However, and this is where the research gap starts. So these controlled trials failed to demonstrate a substantial efficacy and revealed side effects, right? Moreover, there were ethical issues and difficulties in conducting the study and so on. So right then and there, we have the novelty of the paper and it's clear to the reviewer why your paper is so important and why potentially it should be accepted. And the third way in which you can convince the reviewers to get your paper accepted is towards the end of the introduction where you can state the contributions that your paper makes. So let's look at the paper published in Nature on potatoes once again. So if we look at this paragraph, it one by one presents the key takeaways from this paper, the key results and what is truly novel, different and groundbreaking in this paper. So when the reviewer reads it right in the introduction, we've got the importance of the topic, we've got how our study is different from previous studies and what is novel about it. And third, we've got the key results and the key contributions that this paper makes. So it's really difficult not to want to publish such a paper. Now, the second thing that you need to do in order to bring your papers up to the standard of those top Q1 journals is to tell a coherent story. And you've probably heard that before, either from your supervisor or from journal reviewers, but probably also no one has actually explained step by step what a coherent story actually means. And this is exactly what I'm going to do right now. I'll show you eight proven ways in which you can tell a coherent story in your papers to get them accepted in Q1 journals. And as an example, I'll use this paper that I published myself. It's not from the journal Nature, perhaps, but it was published in Language Teaching Research, a journal that, according to Scopus, is journal number five of over 1,000 journals, making it the top 1% journal in my field, while Q1 journals are just top 25%. So the top 
eight proven ways to tell a coherent story are, first of all, follow a proven structure throughout. You see, most Q1 Scopus Index journals, regardless of the discipline, follow a very similar structure in each section of the paper. Let's look, for example, at the introduction. If we open an introduction to almost any paper, like the papers in Nature that we saw, or this paper that I published myself, the structure is very similar. The first paragraph will tell us about the importance of the topic, and we already discussed that. The next paragraph will typically define the key concept that you're introducing and briefly review the literature. That's what's done in the following two paragraphs. And then what we need is the research gap. And we already saw that with the papers published in Nature, you need to make clear what's novel about your study. And this is done in this paragraph. And then you're going to state the aim. And once that's done, as we saw previously, you might present the contributions that your study makes. So number one, if you want to tell a coherent story, follow a proven structure. Number two, very simple, but very often overlooked. You want to link your ideas between paragraphs using linking words like therefore, for example, that clearly showcase to the reader what the connection is. Similarly, you can also use phrases like this, which refers back to what was just mentioned. So to tell a coherent story, link ideas between paragraphs. But what you also need to do is link ideas within paragraphs. And again, this can be done in a similar pattern as between paragraphs. So you can use words like however, you know, therefore, and so on. You can use phrases like this, another, second, to refer back to what you just said in the previous sentence. Now, the fourth thing that you want to do as well is start from general and move to specific later on in each paragraph. So notice that each of the paragraphs here in this introduction starts with a more general sentence that summarizes the main idea of the paragraph. And this happens in every paragraph. This is another example in here. And only afterwards do we go more specific, we provide more examples and we develop that idea. So to tell a coherent story, start with general and then dive more specific. Number five, what you want to do is use the same terms throughout. Don't use five different terms to call the same thing because it's just confusing for the reader. Choose one or maximum two. If you choose two, make it clear to the reader that these two terms will be used interchangeably and then use them throughout the whole paper. The next really simple rule to tell a coherent story is to strive structure your results in a way that answers your research question. Simply put, let's say you have three research aims or three research questions. You want to put your results in the same order in which the research questions appear in your introduction. Number seven, what you want to do as well is discuss the results in the same order that you presented them. So if you first presented result a, in the discussion section, you want to discuss result A first, not result B, because that's going to be confusing and break the pattern. And finally, number eight, to tell a coherent story, you need to connect your conclusion to your research paper aims and the contribution listed in your introduction so that everything fits nicely together. So this will finally allow you to tell a coherent story in your papers. But unless you do the third thing, you're still risking getting your papers rejected. So the third really important thing is to acknowledge the limitations of your research. And look, all research to a greater or lesser extent is limited. Every study has bigger or smaller flaws. And if you don't address them, believe me, I promise the reviewers will address them for you, either leading to a rejection or to major corrections, which sets you back by weeks, if not months. So presenting limitations appropriately in your paper actually steals the ammunition from the reviewers so they have less that they can criticize you for. So let's go back to this paper published in Nature on Parkinson. And if we scroll down to the last part of the paper, just notice how open the researchers are about the limitations of their study. There's an entire paragraph right here that talks about these limitations and lists them one by one. And one really important thing that I'd like you to notice here is that the writers either try to defend their approach and explain how it affected their study. For example, these latter factors may partially explain. So the limitations are clearly connected to what happened in the study and they kind of explain why they obtained the results they obtained, but also they make suggestions for future studies, which again helps to minimize the impact of your limitations. 
And thirdly, what they also do is to show the importance of their findings despite all these limitations right here. And because they do all that, first of all, they acknowledge the limitations, they steal the ammunition from reviewers. Number two, they also defend their approach and they highlight the contribution of the paper. It makes it so much harder to reject this paper or give it a really, really negative review. The fourth thing that you need to do in order to bring your paper to the standard of a Q1 journal is to be concise. Look, let's be honest, no reviewer really wants to read 50 pages of a paper when exactly the same information with exactly the same impact could be conveyed in 20 pages, let's say. I mean, why would they? Don't forget that being a reviewer is not a paid job. They're doing it extra as a contribution to the field, as a way of giving something back to science and to the field. So it's not like reviewers exactly have a lot of time on their hands to read papers and review them. That's why the more concise you can be, the better it actually is for you and the outcome of your paper. And as an example, let's just look at the introductions of the papers that we've just discussed. For example, if we look at this paper on potato, look at how short the introduction is. It's just one, two, there's a big table here. It's just three paragraphs. And in those three paragraphs, the authors are able to clearly and concisely showcase how important the study is, why it is novel, what it brings to the field, and what its main contributions are, all in three short paragraphs. So if it's taking you 10 paragraphs to write the introduction, or God forbid, you have like 3,000 words of introduction and literature review, you need to rethink your approach and make it much more concise. Because believe me, you don't need 10 words when one one word is sufficient. That just makes your paper redundant. It doesn't make it any better. And the last, the fifth tip that I want to show you has to do with language. So the language you use in your papers is really, really important if you truly want to showcase the novelty of your research and fit the standards and the expectations that reviewers of those Q1 journals have for you. And it all has to do with how precise your vocabulary is. So a very simple way to think about it is consider a word such as good. A word like good has a million different meanings and can be applied in a million different contexts. But a word like appropriate, acceptable, beneficial, superior, these are all much more specific. And these words that I've just listed would be much more appropriate for writing a paper than using a word like good because they are much more specific and they say exactly what you mean. To give you another example, let's take the word get. You can get a better salary, you can get data, you can get accepted into university, you can get your PhD, get your paper published, but there are much more specific and precise words that you should be using in papers that will showcase what really you're trying to say, right? Words like obtain, gain, words like graduate rather than get a PhD. So the whole point here is that you need to look for words that specifically and precisely say what you actually mean rather than use words that have a very generic meaning and can be used in all sorts of different contexts. This will help make your language much more precise and increase your chances of getting the papers accepted because your, the novelty of your ideas will truly shine through your words. So now that you know exactly what you need to do to improve your paper to Q1 Scopus Index standards, let me show you how you can write and submit your next paper to a Q1 Scopus Index journal in just 48 hours. I will reveal four little known tricks and hacks that you can use to write your paper in as little as a weekend. So watch this video next.